Hello, and welcome to the Rune Dune series. It's common with runes that informative books and articles see fragments of information. Our surviving rune poems, a few carvings, and Norse myths. And from these shreds of evidence, which are separated by hundreds of miles and hundreds of years, they extrapolate a whole belief system about runes. Analysis of runes is often tied, even in academia, to pagan or neo-pagan concepts, when the vast majority of our runic evidence comes from Christian cultures and has little to do with pagan belief. This is nothing short of historical malpractice. In this video series, I'm going to look at these rune poems. The Old English rune poem, the Norwegian rune poem, and the Icelandic rune poem. The names that these poems have for runes are mnemonics, names which are easy to remember to enable people to remember runes sound values. The names offer an insight into a fascinating aspect of the Germanic, Anglo-Saxon and Norse mindset. Through them, we can see a limited scope of how these people saw their world and their place in it. But we don't often see evidence of worship of these concepts. And even if we do, we cannot extrapolate them to recreate the ancient pagan past. Doing this will harm our understanding of runes and cultures as we perceive them. But I should also give a disclaimer. I'm an Anglo-Saxon specialist, so I say more about Old English runes than I do about Norwegian and Icelandic. I know more about Old English poetry and Anglo-Saxon culture than I do about sagas, skaldic poetry, and Old Norse. But the Old English poem also has more to say about it. It's longer, more than twice as many runes, and more lines devoted to each rune. By contrast, the Icelandic and Norwegian poems rarely give information about their runes. Nevertheless, if you see parallels with skaldic poetry or sagas, do let me know in the comments. This is an area about which I know little. Let's teach each other. Without further ado, the Rune June series. This is the first rune of the Elder Futhark, the Younger Futhark, and the Anglo-Frisian Futhark. In all three runic alphabets, the rune appears similar to the Latin alphabet's F, so it probably comes from Latin influence. In all alphabets, it represents the same sound value, F, as in feed. In Old English, its name is Feo. In Old Norse, its name is Fe. Its reconstructed Elder Futhark name is Fehu. These are taken to mean wealth, and it's a term that came from an older term which meant cattle or livestock. Why are the terms for cattle and wealth related? In an agricultural society, functional wealth genuinely useful, movable and tradable wealth can only be stored in livestock. All other stores of wealth are not functional or useful. As time went on, the term for livestock as a measure of wealth would become broadened to encompass other forms of wealth as well, and it would eventually divorce from its association with cattle. The Old English rune poem tells us that wealth is a benefit to all men, Yet every man must share it freely if he wishes to gain glory before the Lord. The Old Icelandic poem tells us that wealth is a source of discord among kinsmen, and fire of the sea and path of the serpent. The Old Norwegian rune poem tells us wealth is a source of discord amongst kin. The wolf lives in the forest. All three warn against the accumulation of wealth. While this can be interpreted as a Christian ethos, it is also Germanic in origin. The social bonds of Germanic society are held together by the sharing of wealth. The poem Beowulf shows us that it's in the nature of good kings and good people to share their wealth. But hoarding wealth is the nature of a bad king. As the old Norwegian and Icelandic poems tell us, it is the reserve of lone wolves, or the path of the serpent, dragon, to hoard wealth. This is the second rune of the Elder Futhark, the Younger Futhark, and the Anglo-Frisian Futhark. In all of them, 
it represents the same sound value, the modern English long oo sound, as in food. In the younger futhark, it also represents the sounds e, v, and w. In all three alphabets, the rune appears quite similar to the Latin alphabets u and v, only flipped upside down. It probably reflects Latin influence. It has two variant forms, which appear interchangeably. In Old English and Old Norse, its name is Ur, and its reconstructed Elder Futhark name is either Uruz or Ura. We're uncertain about its reconstructed name, because even though the name in Old English and Old Norse is the same, the three poems that we have use the same name to mean different things. In Old English, an Ur seems to be an auric, that is, a wild ox, a large species which could be found all over Eurasia and North Africa at one time, but which dwindled and went extinct in the 17th century. The Ur is courageous and has huge horns, a very fierce beast. It fights with its horns, a notorious moorwalker. That is a brave creature. In Old Icelandic, Ur seems to mean rain. Ur is lamentation of the clouds, and ruin of the hay harvest, and abomination of the shepherd. In Old Norwegian, it seems to refer to dross, the waste product of producing iron. Ur comes from bad iron. The reindeer often races over the frozen snow. Hunting was an important part of early English society and the horns of wild aurochs were widely used as drinking vessels in the Germanic world. They were extinct in Britain over a millennium prior to the Anglo-Saxon period, though. Few inhabitants of the British Isles would ever have seen one. Maureen Halsall theorises that the continued use of auroch horns as drinking vessels provided from the Germanic world could keep the creature fresh in the popular imagination. The knowledge that these creatures were large, much larger than any animal hunted in the British Isles, may have helped the name to persist. It does seem, from its description, to be regarded with respect and nobility, perhaps reflecting that its drinking horns were rare and valuable, the reserve of kings and nobility. It is worth noting that Kunawulf, the poet, seems to assign the rune the meaning of ure, meaning ours. Perhaps rune names were much more malleable than we would think. It's because of the difference between the Icelandic and English rune names that we aren't sure how to recreate the name of the Elder Futhark rune. It could be Uras, meaning auric, or Ura, meaning water. This is the third rune of the Elder Futhark, the Younger Futhark, and the Anglo Frisian Futhark, and in all of them, it represents the same sound value, th or th, as in thing or that. This sound value is rare around the world. Very few languages have it because it's a hard sound to make. It's disappeared from modern Swedish, Norwegian, Danish, and German, leaving only Icelandic and English as the Germanic languages which still have it. One sound which replaces it, and the sound which people who can't pronounce the th sound make, is d, and so it makes sense that the rune resembles the Latin d. It probably stems from this letter. It was adopted into the Latin alphabet in English and Icelandic writing, making its twigs into more of a curve. In modern English, it's been replaced with th, but the rune is still used in modern Icelandic. In Old English, it is named thorn, as in a thorn from a plant, and in Old Icelandic and Old Norwegian, it's named Thurs, the name for a giant, or more generally a demon-like creature. Its Germanic name has been reconstructed as Thurisaz, meaning giant. The Icelandic rune poem says, Thurs, torture of women and cliff dweller and husband of a giantess. The Norwegian rune poem says that the thurs causes anguish to women, misfortune makes few men cheerful. And the Old English rune poem says the thorn is extremely sharp, painful for any warrior to grasp, 
immeasurably fierce to any man who rests among them. The word Thurs existed in Old English. It's a term used to describe Grendel in Beowulf, who was also the kin of Cain. Why this isn't the name of the rune is uncertain. One interpretation is that it was changed by Christians to purge the Futhork of references to heathen mythology. But the term Thurs isn't explicitly associated with heathen mythology. Chris Bishop has argued that Thurs are associated with the nefarious aspects of the supernatural, which may lend some credence to a church-led change. I am somewhat convinced by this. Not that the church would change it because it is pagan, but that they would change it out of some secular belief in the supernatural. But I'll leave the debate on this for you in the comments. This rune is the fourth rune in the Elder Futhark, Younger Futhark and Anglo-Frisian Futhark. It's our first differentiation between different runic alphabets. All of them come from the original Elder Futhark rune, which is somewhat similar to the Latin A and Greek Alpha, if you account for how it is drawn. In the Elder Futhark, it represents an A, as in hat. But in the Anglo-Frisian Futhark, it comes to represent a long O sound, extending the O in Go. In the younger Futhark, it represents an R, present in the word ambiance. In later inscriptions, it becomes the same as the Old English rune. In Old Norse, it is named Ars, later Ors. In the Icelandic poem, this means a pagan god, specifically Odin. In the Norwegian poem, this same word refers to a river estuary. Most puzzlingly, though, in Old English, the word seems to mean the Latin word ors, meaning mouth. The recreated Elder Futhark name is ansus, meaning god, probably in a more general sense than in the Icelandic poem. In Icelandic, ars, aged gauter, and prince of Asgard, and lord of Valhalla. In Norwegian, ars is the way of most journeys but a scabbard is of swords. In Old English, Ors is the source of every utterance, the support of wisdom and comfort to wise men, and the joy and delight of every noble. It's not really possible to read the Old English rune poem as meaning anything else. There are no known myths that make Woden the source of speech, and even if there were, these wouldn't be perpetuated by a Christian scribe. The Old English word us, meaning God, appears to be rare by the time this poem was written. This makes sense, as the word would have no use once monotheism is adopted. The Latin word us is the only word for which this riddle can be solved. Referring to a simple Latin word like mouth to assist people in learning their runic alphabet would be a practical solution to a confusing problem that the word us had fallen out of popular use. We'll come back to this rune later, with the video on the 25th and 26th Anglo-Frisian runes. This is the fifth rune of the Elder Futhark, Younger Futhark, and Anglo-Frisian Futhark, and in all of them, it represents the same sound value, the R as in the modern word road. The existence of this rune tells us that the Germanic, Norse, and Old English er sound in the middle of words was probably rhotic, as in the modern American or Cornish accent, rather than non-rhotic, as in my accent. The rune resembles the Latin R very closely, and is clearly borrowed from the Latin alphabet. The Icelandic, Norwegian, and Old English rune poems all name this rune Ride or Journey. Ryeth in Norwegian, Raith in Icelandic, and Rad in Old English. Consequently, its reconstructed Elder Futhark name is Raido. In the Norwegian, Raith is said to be the worst thing for horses. Regin forged the finest sword. In the Icelandic, Raith is of sitting a blessing, and swift journey, and horses toiling. The Old English tells us, Rad seems easy to every warrior while he is indoors, and very courageous to him who traverses the high roads on the back of a stout horse. All three refer specifically to horses and the labour which they go through in the context of riding. 
The Old English poem has been interpreted differently as well, as referring to the harness of a horse or to music, both of which were suggested because of a strange tangent of riding seeming easy while indoors. The purpose of this is probably producing a contrast between those who are willing to boast of their travels and those who do actually travel, an Old English poetic acknowledgement that actions speak louder than words. This is the sixth rune of the Elder Futhark, the Younger Futhark, and the Old English Futhark. Its appearance varies between the three, but it never varies too much away from a similar appearance to the Latin C or K. The sound it represents is K, as in corn, but it can also be used in the Younger Futhark to represent the G sound, as in the modern English green. In Old English, particularly Northumbria, it also represents the sound ch, as in the modern English chair. We'll come back to this possibility with the 30th and 31st runes of the Futhork. The Old English rune poem gives this rune the name ken, meaning torch, saying that ken is known to all the living by its flame, shining and bright. Most often it burns inside where princes sit at ease. But the Old Norwegian and Old Icelandic instead give it the name Korn, meaning also. In Norwegian, it says, Korn is fatal to children. Death makes a corpse pale. And in Icelandic, it says, Korn is fatal to children, and painful spot, and abode of mortification. The use of ken to mean torch in Old English is interesting, as the word itself is unattested. The rune is used in text as a replacement for the word. We're only aware of the word by solving the poem as though it were a riddle, and with the similar Old High German word ken, chien, or chen, and a gloss left by George Hicks from the 17th century. But where he found it out was probably lost in the Ashburnham House Fire of 1731. Because the word was never used without its rune, we can guess it was a fairly archaic word that was out of common use by the time the poem was written. The use of corn in Norwegian and Icelandic probably reflects the archaism of ken as well, but it makes the process of working out what this Elder Futhark rune's name might have been impossible. We name it either Kaunan or Kenaz, but we don't know what it means. It's nothing short of a guess. This is the seventh rune of the Elder Futhark, and the seventh rune of the Anglo-Frisian Futhark. It's unattested in the Younger Futhark, because its sound value, g, as in garden, was represented instead by rune six, corn. Its sound in Old English might change in Northumbria. We'll come back to this possibility with runes 30 and 31 of the Futhark. The rune does not at all resemble the Latin g, but its shape is identical to the Latin X, which Jantina Luigenga has argued might be because the Latin sound value was, around the 3rd century BC, similar to the Germanic G sound. In the Old English rune poem, the rune is taken to mean Gifu, or gift, so its Elder Futhark reconstructed name is Gibo, but the rune poem begins with Gumena, which doesn't refer specifically to a gift, it more represents the concept of generosity, the act of giving, rather than the gift itself. Gumena is a grace in men of position and deserving of praise, a prop to their honour, and for all the dispossessed, it is a help and a means of survival when they have no other. What it tells us is similar to the rune feo, or wealth. Both of them emphasise the importance of gift giving in Germanic culture, an act which cements the bonds of Germanic society. This is even the case for society's most poor. When a slave in Beowulf steals a cup from a dragon and gives it to his lord, he manages to buy his freedom, a fact which is unchanged and for which he is unpunished, even after causing the destructive ramifications of pissing off a dragon. This is the eighth rune of the Elder Futhark and the Anglo-Frisian Futhark. It's unattested in the younger Futhark because its sound value, w, as in wonder, is instead represented by the second rune, ur. The rune doesn't seem to resemble any letter of the Latin alphabet. 
This would lead us to believe that its resemblance comes from one of Latin's siblings or ancestors. The Old English rune poem tells us that the rune's name, Win, means joy. Win is the man who knows no miseries, afflictions or sorrow, and who has prosperity and happiness, and the wealth of great towns. The poem ties the concept of joy to living in an established community, protected from marauders, invaders or crime. The Germanic rune name has been reconstructed as Wunjo, meaning joy. Along with Thorn, Win was adopted into the Latin alphabet in around the 8th century to represent the W sound. The letter U used to represent this sound in Latin, but its sound value had changed in late antiquity to be a V sound. In around the 13th century, Win declined, and it was instead replaced with two Latin U's, or W. This is the ninth rune in the Elder Futhark and the Anglo-Frisian Futhark, and it's the seventh rune in the Younger Futhark. In all three, it represents the sound value H, as in hello. The Elder Futhark rune is practically identical to the Latin letter H, so is probably related. In the Younger Futhark, one stem is removed and replaced with another twig. In the Anglo-Frisian Futhark, it becomes most common that the rune's stems are double twigged, but the other two forms are also used. In Old English and Old Norse, this rune is named Hail, as in the weather event. Hail in Old English, Hagal in Old Norse. The Old English rune poem tells us that Hail is the whitest of grains, it swirls from the heights of heaven, and gusts of wind toss it about. Then, it turns to water. Icelandic tells us that Hagal is cold grain, and a shower of sleet, and sickness of serpents. Norwegian tells us that Hagal is the coldest of grain. Christ created the world of old. Because all three share a name, we can probably say that the rune name and its sound value have been consistent for a while. The recreated Elder Futhark name is Haglaz, or Hagalaz, meaning hail. When I first read the Old English rune poem, I was struck by how pleasant it makes hail sound. Jennifer Neville has argued that Old English poetry rarely makes the natural world seem in sympathy with human interests. The weather is, at best, indifferent to human suffering, and at worst, it actively promotes it. If we look at The Wanderer, Another Old English poem, we're told about the storms striking against rocky cliffs, attacking snowstorms, binding the earth, the howling of winter, then the darkness comes and sends a fierce hailstorm from the north in enmity against men. Hail is part of an endless barrage of hostile weather making life miserable. But in the rune poem, hail is described with two necessities, first as the whitest of grains, a kenning with a long history, judging by its parallel in Norwegian and Icelandic, and then by its transition into becoming water, the source of all life. This is also the second time that the Icelandic rune poem has mentioned serpents. As dragons are so associated with heat and fire, the cool of hail could be a contrast to the mythical fire-breathing dragon. The younger Futhark variant of this rune is most notable for its appearance in the modern logo for Bluetooth where it is combined with rune 13 of the Younger Futhark to make a bind rune standing for Harald Bluetooth, who united the Danish people just as Bluetooth united various connecting standards. This is the 10th rune of the Elder Futhark and the Anglo-Frisian Futhark. It's the 8th rune of the Younger Futhark. Its shape doesn't change much in its history, and its sound value stays consistent as well. It represents the N sound, as in night. The appearance of the rune doesn't seem to have any relation to the Latin N. This is probably an intentional decision, because otherwise it would look too similar to the Latin H, or rune 9. In Old English, the rune is named Need, and in Old Icelandic and Norwegian, it's named Nauther. Both of these are related words with similar meanings, Though it is pronounced the same as modern English need, its meaning, though related, is different. It means something more like constraint, hardship, oppression, or affliction. 
The Elder Futhark name has been reconstructed as Naudis. The Old English poem tells us that need oppresses the heart, yet nonetheless, often it is transformed for the sons of men to a source of help and salvation, if only they heed it in time. The Old Icelandic says, Nauda is grief of the bond made, and state of oppression and toilsome work. And the Old Norwegian says, Nauda gives scant choice, a naked man is chilled by the frost. In the Icelandic and Norwegian poems, the concept is seen as something which must be endured. But in the Old English poem, need, or hardships, assist people towards becoming better Christians. Through hardships, they can achieve help and salvation. Maureen Halsall considers it interesting to note that, in the Old English rune poem, the concept of need is put between the H rune hail and the I rune is, meaning hail and ice, both of which can be quite constraining on a person's ability to travel. The negative connotations of need in the Old English poem is put into a didactic or teaching purpose. This is the eleventh rune of the Elder Futhark and the Anglo-Frisian Futhark, and it's the ninth rune of the Younger Futhark. It represents the I sound as in big, and represents a longer E sound as in greed. Its shape is very simple, so it's unsurprising that it doesn't change much, and it's identical to the Latin I, so it probably comes from it, or at least from the same root. In Old English, Old Norwegian and Old Icelandic, the rune is named Is. The Elder Futhark rune has been named Isaz, all of which mean ice. The Old English rune poem says that Is is very cold, extremely slippery, a floor made by the frost, fair to the sight. It glitters like jewels, clear as glass. The Norwegian poem says Is is called the broad bridge, the blind man must be led. The Icelandic poem says, Is is bark of rivers, and roof of the wave, and destruction of the doomed. All three poems seem to focus on the tendency of ice to cover water. Old English considers it a floor, Old Norwegian considers it a bridge, and Old Icelandic calls it a bark of rivers, as a bark would cover a tree, and a roof of the wave, as a roof would cover a house. The Icelandic rune poem labelling ice as the destruction of the doomed is odd, and it could link to the Norse mythological event Ragnarok, where the Jotun, or frost giants, will be responsible for the end of the world. That connection, while tempting, is a bit tenuous. Like the ninth rune Hail, the Old English rune poem makes weather sound pleasant, which is very unlike most Old English poetry which tends to depict it as actively hostile to humans. To compare, the Old English Maxims 1, which speaks of ice covering, seems a lot more negative. Frost shall freeze, ice shall form a bridge, water wear a cover, mysterious a lock up the growing things of earth. It's interesting how innocuous the Old English rune poem makes winter weather sound. This is the twelfth rune of the Elder Futhark and the Anglo-Frisian Futhark, and it's the tenth rune of the Younger Futhark. In the Elder Futhark and Futhark, it represents the sound value y, as in yes, and it's co-opted to represent the j sound, as in jumper. But in the Younger Futhark, it represents a, as in hat. The shape of the rune undergoes quite a lot of change. The Elder Futhark rune is only one of two runes which has no stem, and it's the only room with two non-connected parts. In the Anglo-Frisian Futhork, it's given a stave and appears varyingly like this and like this, the latter being more common in manuscripts and the former in inscriptions. We'll come back to the latter when we discuss the 28th room of the Old English rune poem. The younger Futhark also gives the rune a stave and removes some of its twigs. Because of its different sound value and its change in appearance, there is an argument to be made that it's an entirely different rune. In Old English, the rune name is Jör, and in Old Norwegian and Old Icelandic, it is Ar. Both of them mean year, but refer specifically to different parts of the year, rather than the year as a whole. The Germanic name for the rune has been reconstructed either as Jöran or Jöraz. 
In Old English, year is a joy to men. When God, the Holy King of Heaven, makes the earth bring forth bright fruits for rich and poor alike. Icelandic says that ar is a boon to men, and good summer and thriving crops. The Norwegian says ar is a boon to men. I say that frothy was generous. The Old English rune poem seems to attribute the year to early spring, which allows for abundant crops. But the Icelandic seems to attribute the ar to the height of summer, mentioning that crops are already thriving. The sound value of the rune changes so drastically in Old Norse because the word has evolved to lose its initial sound y, being replaced only with the second phoneme of the word. The y sound in Old Norse is attributed to a new rune, which we'll come back to on the 16th rune of the Younger Futhark. In later Old English, the g rune gifu also begins to represent the sound of the y rune, making it redundant and so rare in later inscriptions. This rune is the 13th in the Old English Futhark and the Elder Futhark. It's not present in the Younger Futhark. Its sound value is inconsistent. It's been used for the E as in pre, but also for the consonant in the German ich or softer, as in the Scots language loch. To make matters even more complicated, the name it's being given in the Old English rune poem is eo, suggesting that, at least in the poem, it should be read as a diphthong from the E to the O, as though extending the E in Beowulf. The rune name, meaning you, is written elsewhere as eo or you. Another suggestion is that it represents the yo or j, as in casual. This is backed up because tracing the word yo back leads to the name of the rune in the rune poem. Overall, whatever sound value the rune represents, and also probably its rune name, is variable in different Old English contexts. The Elder Futhark's reconstructed name is either Ehaz or Ewaz. The rune poem says, Eo is a tree with rough bark and hard and firm in the earth, supported by its roots. A keeper of flame, a pleasure to have on one's land. Maureen Halsall points out that the yew tree was prized in Germanic and Celtic culture alike. And I've talked before about my own research into the yew tree in relation to the Norse hunting god Ulla. Further, the tree's wood burns fast, so it makes sense that its usefulness as firewood is noted within the rune poem. We'll come back to this concept when we discuss the 16th rune of the Younger Futhark. This is the 14th rune in the Old English Futhark and in the Elder Futhark. It's not present in the Younger Futhark because its sound value, p as in pair, is shared with the 13th rune of the Younger Futhark. With most runes, we know the rune name, but we struggle with the rune's sound value. But this rune is the inverse. We know the rune's sound value, but its name is a mystery. In the Old English rune poem, we know the rune's name, Perth, but outside of the rune, we don't know what a Perth is. Suggestions which have been made include throat, apple tree, penis, of course, and most convincing, but by no means actually convincing is some kind of game box or game piece, possibly a chess piece or dice. We don't know what its older name may have been, but it's been reconstructed as Perthu, Pertho, or Perthaz. The Old English rune poem tells us that Perth is a continual source of amusement and laughter for the great, where warriors sit cheerfully in the beer hall. The rune poem's verse is incomplete, possibly because of an originally badly damaged manuscript which doesn't help us with solving the riddle of what a Perth is. Whatever it is, it's clearly associated with joy, and specifically within the hall. Beowulf records that men do play games in the hall, which is what makes me, personally, think that this is a game piece of some kind. But we'll likely never know what it is for certain. We'll come back to Perth when we discuss a later rune, which might be seen as the 33rd rune of the Anglo-Frisian Futhork. This is the 15th rune in the Elder Futhark and the Anglo-Frisian Futhark, 
and it's the 16th and final rune in the Younger Futhark. The rune has preserved its original place in the Futhark, but probably due to a change in its sound value and appearance, it fell to last place in the Younger Futhark. In Old Germanic, this rune represented the Z sound, as in the modern English zebra, which was common on the end of words in Old Germanic. You may have noticed it on the end of reconstructed rune names, but in Old English and Old Norse, this noun ending was no longer used, so the rune no longer served a practical purpose. In the Younger Futhark, the rune would have gone extinct, but it was adopted to give at first the sound value r, somewhere between a z and a r, and later it instead represents the sound value u, not a common sound in modern English, but present in the French word tu. To represent this sound, it was flipped upside down from its original bearing. In Old English, it is adopted to refer to the x sound, as in the modern English axe. It's also used on St. Cuthbert's coffin to write the abbreviation of Jesus Christ in runes, where it acts as a substitute for the Greek letter chi. The Old English rune poem partially names this rune elk, but this is only part of the compound word which is used to create the x sound which doesn't occur at the beginning of words. The rune's name is elk sedge, a type of sharp grass. Elk sedge usually dwells in a marsh. Growing in the water, it gives grievous wounds, staining with blood every man who lays a hand on it. From this, the rune's Elder Futhark name has been reconstructed as Algis. This is nothing short of a guess. We don't remotely know what its name may have been. In the Old Icelandic and Old Norwegian poems, the rune is named Ur, meaning you, as in the tree. When the 13th rune was dropped from the Futhark, it's likely that this rune inherited the old rune's name, so as to give it a sound value which needed representing. The Old Icelandic rune poem says, Ur bent bow and brittle iron, a giant of the arrow. The Old Norwegian says, Ur is the greenest of trees in winter. It is wont to crackle when it burns. The Old Norwegian refers, like the Old English Eo rune, to the wood's usefulness in burning, and the Old Icelandic refers to the tree's usefulness for crafting bows and arrow shafts. It's interesting to note that hunting was not performed in Iceland, and yew trees did not grow there. Its remembrance in the rune poem is a reminder that this information could be remembered and recalled long after it was relevant, if it were culturally impactful. This rune is the 16th in the Elder Futhark and the Anglo-Frisian Futhark, and is the 11th in the Younger Futhark. Its shape changes slightly, but it's recognisably similar, and it's clearly related to the Latin letter S and Greek sigma. It makes sense that its sound value is S, as in the modern English sleep. In Old English, the rune is named Seal, and in Old Icelandic and Old Norwegian, it's named Sol, both of which mean sun. The Elder Futhark's recreated name is Sowilo. The Old English rune poem says, Seagull is a continual joy to seamen, where they take a sea steed over the fisher's bath until it brings them to land. The Icelandic rune poem says, Sol, shield of the clouds, and shining ray, and destroyer of ice. The Norwegian rune poem says, Sol is the light of the world, I bow to the divine decree. Tolkien has argued that the Old English rune word Siegel is chosen because of its similarity to the Latin word Siegel, meaning jewel, so the Old English rune poem could be making a double entendre by linking a shining jewel to the shining sun. This rune is, unfortunately, most famous for its use in the logo for the Schutzstaffel, the paramilitary organisation of the Nazi party. Its use there was in the misguided belief that the rune meant Sieg, or victory. It was so popular that typewriters in Germany were edited to include the ability to type the bind rune of two S's with a single keystroke. The meaning victory was certainly made up by Guido von Liszt in the early 20th century. But of course, the damage on the perception of this rune has been done, 
and it's associated in the modern eye with authoritarianism. This is the 17th rune of the Elder Futhark and Anglo-Frisian Futhark, and it's the 12th rune of the Younger Futhark. Its shape stays fairly consistent through its thousand year history, resembling the Latin letter T. So it makes sense that its sound value is T, as in the modern English tin. In Old Icelandic and Old Norwegian, the meaning of the rune is Tyr. Old Icelandic says Tyr, the god with one hand, the leavings of the wolf, the prince of temples. Old Norwegian says Tyr is the one handed god, often has the smith to blow. Both poems refer to the story in Norse mythology where the wolf Fenrir bit off the god Tyr's hand a sacrifice which enables the gods to tie Fenrir up and delay the end of the world. It's probable that Tyr was in Germanic mythology a more important god than he is in surviving Icelandic myths. Maureen Halsall mentions that it's possible that he was the head of the Germanic pantheon before being supplanted by Odin or Woden, but this can only be inferred from the etymology of his name and its cognate relationship with the Greek god Zeus. This then brings us to the Old English rune poem, which has glossed the rune as Tyr. Tyr is one of the guiding stars. Well does it keep faith with princes. Always it holds its course above the night clouds. It never fails. It refers instead to a guiding star or constellation which is probably named after the god. Possibilities include the planet Mars, the North Star, or some other constellation like Orion but equally, it seems to refer to the abstract concept of honour. This could be a double entendre. There's no doubt that, at one time, the Old English rune name was shared with the Old Icelandic and Old Norwegian poems in lauding the god Tiu, as he was known in Old English. For this reason, the Elder Futhark name has been reconstructed as Tiwaz, but in the Christian context of Anglo-Saxon Britain, directly mentioning or praising the god Tu would obviously be unsavoury. This doesn't make the Old English rune poem any less legitimate, though. To paraphrase Tolkien, to view the Old English rune poem as representative of a more pure previous rune poem can only do harm to how we perceive the poem as it lies before us. At the end of the day, these rune poems are mnemonic devices to remember the sound value of runes, and it's fascinating to us that there is a heavenly body of some sort which still carries the name of the god Tu. This is the 18th rune of the Elder Futhark and Anglo-Frisian Futhark, and it's the 13th rune of the Younger Futhark. Its shape stays consistent, and it's practically identical to the Latin B and the Greek Beta. The rune's sound value is also consistent, as it represents the B sound, as in the modern English bear. The names of the rune are very similar. The Icelandic rune poem names this rune Bjarkan, as does the Norwegian rune poem. The Old English rune poem names it Berch. The Elder Futhark recreated name is Berkanan. Berch has no fruit. Nonetheless, it bears shoots without seed. It is beautiful in its branches, high of crown, fairly adorned, tall and leafy. It reaches up to touch the sky. The Icelandic tells us that Bjarkan is a leafy twig and little tree and fresh young shrub. Norwegian tells us Bjarkan has the greatest leaves of any shrub. Loki was fortunate in his deceit. The old Scandinavian words refer to a birch twig and it would appear at first glance that the old English birch is a birch tree. But as R.I. Page points out, the text clearly describes a tree which is grown from root suckers rather than seed, and this cannot be a birch. The alternative is that the poem refers to the grey poplar, which grows tall and can reproduce without fruit or seed. Of course, this doesn't mean that the rune's name is wrong, it just means that the poet refers to the poplar tree, or whichever tree it is, as a birch. This rune is the 19th of the Elder Futhark and the Anglo-Frisian Futhark. It has no equivalent in the Younger Futhark, as its sound value doesn't occur commonly in Old Norse. 
Its sound value is the e sound, as in echo, but its older inscriptions can also represent the diphthong eo, as in Beowulf, similar to the 15th rune of the Anglo-Frisian Futhork. The Old English rune poem gives the name eo, or e, meaning horse. It says that e is the joy of princes in noble company, the charger proud in its hoofs, when warriors, prosperous ones on horseback, discuss its points, and to the restless it always proves a remedy. I've analysed the two founders of Kent before. This rune, and their names, Hengist and Horsa, gives us some glimpse of a broader pre-Christian worship of horses in the Germanic world, as well as Anglo-Saxon England. The fascination with horses obviously survived conversion, as they are simply practical animals. In Beowulf, after Grendel is killed, Beowulf is given a collection of horses, one of which wears a saddle which is adorned in jewels. The rune poem tells us more about how horses were seen, and contextualises this gift. Horses were seen as important status symbols for nobles like Beowulf. This is the 20th rune of the Elder Futhark and Anglo-Frisian Futhark. It's the 14th rune of the Younger Futhark. Its shape stays fairly consistent between the Elder Futhark and Futhark, but it changes quite a bit in the Younger Futhark. Its shape is similar to the Latin alphabet's M, and probably shares a root with it. Its sound value is consistent, M, as in main. The Old English rune poem tells us that Man rejoicing in life is cherished by his kinsmen, yet everyone must betray his fellow, because the Lord, by his decree, commits the wretched human body to earth. In Old Icelandic, it says, Mother is the delight of man, and augmentation of the earth, and adorner of ships. The Old Norwegian poem says, Mother is the augmentation of the dust, great is the claw of the hawk. In Old English and Old Norse, the rune is named Man and Mather respectively. The Elder Futhark recreated name is Manaz, and all three mean man, not in our modern gendered sense, but more generally meaning person or human. Specifically, this is man as separated from the soul. All three rune poems discuss man as being made from dust. This is in reference to the creation myth in the Bible. Genesis 2.7 says, And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground, and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul. Both the Old Icelandic and Old English rune poems emphasise the bonds of Germanic kinship as well, speaking of the joy that humans can bring to each other, like in Beowulf, where Herot is described as the best hall, filled with men. It is made glorious for being filled with people, unlike the hall which Grendel lives in. The Old English poem ends the passage by emphasising man's relationship with the earth. Man will one day become dust again. All the passages are interpreting the rune in a Christian culture, but obviously understand man in a Germanic sense as well. This is the 21st rune of the Elder Futhark and the Futhark, and it's the 15th rune of the Younger Futhark. Its shape stays entirely consistent throughout the thousand year history of runes. Its shape is similar to the Latin letter L, and its sound value is L, as in the modern English land. The Old English rune poem says that Lagu seems interminable to man, if they venture on the rolling bark and the waves of the sea terrify them, and the stallion of the deep heeds not its bridle. The Old Icelandic says Loga is eddying stream, and broad geyser, and land of the fish. Old Norwegian says that Loga is a river which falls from a mountainside, but ornaments are of gold. The name of this rune stays the same, but is also variable. In Old English, it seems to refer specifically to the sea or the ocean. But in Old Icelandic, it refers to water more generally. In Old Norwegian, it refers specifically to a waterfall. Because of this, the Elder Futhark name has been recreated as Lagus, meaning lake or water. There is also a theory put forward by Wolfgang Krauss that the Elder Futhark name for this rune is Laukaz, 
a word meaning leek, or more generally a herb. His logic is that, in Norse skaldic poetry, the leek is associated with fertility. Maureen Halsall says that the proposal is unlikely, and R.I. Page adds that, whether you accept it or not, depends on how closely you think that runes were connected with Germanic paganism. Increasingly, runes are being seen as having little connection to pre-Christian belief, and are seen more as a practical tool for writing. But this doesn't inherently rule Krauss's possibility out. There is no reason to think that rune names or rune meanings should stay consistent in different areas or different contexts. To one person, the rune could be Lagus. To another, it could be Laukaz. Or even to the same person in different contexts, this could be different. This is the 22nd rune of the Elder Futhark and the Anglo-Frisian Futhark. An equivalent is unattested in the Younger Futhark. Its shape stays mostly consistent, but it has no apparent origin, likely because of the unusual sound that it represents. It is used to represent the ng sound in England. In the Old English rune poem, we are told that ng was the first among the East Danes, so seen until he went east, or back, over the sea. His wagon ran after. Thus, the Hayardrings named that hero. There is uncertainty whether the poem says that Ing goes east or back across the sea, but it appears that the Ing rune is named after a mostly unattested hero named Ing. Beowulf sometimes refers to the Danes as the Ingwene, the friends of Ing. Tacitus, writing in the second century, tells us about the Ingaiwones, a group which Tacitus singles out as living near the sea. Tacitus also mentions an island where people worship a goddess named Nerthus, with a sacred car or chariot. In later Norse sources, the god Freyr has a second name, Ingvi, with descendants named the Inglingar. These shreds of evidence point towards a folkloric figure named Ing, who may have been a god, that has been written about in the Old English rune poem as a hero. Based on this evidence, the Elder Futhark name has been reconstructed as Ingwaz. It's worth noting that this is common. Woden, the probable head of the Anglo-Saxon pantheon, gets this treatment as well. After conversion, he was still an immensely popular figure. It can be argued, and I have, that Hengist receives this treatment too. If these figures are demoted from god to hero, then recently converted Christians can still tell stories about these famous men, and they aren't technically participating in heathenous acts. In the rune poem, this is the 24th rune, but in most standardised runic alphabets, this is the 23rd rune of the Elder Futhark, and of the Anglo-Frisian Futhark. It's usually unattested in the Younger Futhark, it doesn't really resemble any letter from the Latin alphabet, and it represents the sound value D, as in deer. In the Younger Futhark, the D is represented by its twelfth rune. In the Old English rune poem, we are told, Day is sent by the Lord, beloved by mankind, the glorious light of the Creator, a source of joy and hope, to the haves and have-nots, of benefit to everyone. The rune refers to the day and the light of the sun, praising the Christian god for this. The Elder Futhar recreated name is Dagaz. This rune has been connected in past academic works to sun worship, and also to the cult of the Divine Twins, but we have no compelling evidence for either of these things, so we should treat these claims with great caution. Likewise, the rune's continued use in Christian holy texts shows us that these associations did not persist. I mentioned earlier that the rune is usually unattested in the Younger Futhark. I say usually because it is present on a 9th century runestone in Ingolstad, Ostergotland, Sweden. It's used alongside a collection of Younger Futhark runes. This has been interpreted as a personal name, possibly an individual named the Old Norse word Daga. This would mean that part of the inscription reads, Daga cut this on the cliff face. I would treat the decoding of this personal name with much more cynicism than this. The rune could represent a different name entirely, but its presence on a 9th century runestone means either 
Knowledge of the Elder Futhark had persisted into the 9th century, or this person had been to Britain, learned the Anglo-Frisian Futhark, and brought that knowledge back with him. Either interpretation is interesting. In the Old English rune poem, this is the 23rd rune, but in most standardised runic alphabets, this is the 24th rune of both the Elder Futhark and of the Futhark. In the Elder Futhark, its sound value is o, oh, as in odd. In the Anglo-Frisian Futhark, this rune at first represents a combined mixture of the o sound to an e sound, which isn't present in modern English. Later, the sound value becomes e, eh, as in echo, competing with rune 19. In the Old English rune poem, we're told, Ethel is very dear to every man provided that there in his own house he may enjoy everything that is right and proper in constant prosperity. It refers to a person's home, landstead, or possibly place of origin in a generational sense. Its Elder Futhark name has been reconstructed as Odal or Othala. It's interesting to note that the rune poem mentions not only the rights that a man enjoys in their landstead, but also the obligations which they owe to their lord and to society at large, by mentioning everything that is right and proper. The rune is rarely used for its sound value in Old English, but despite this, it was a widely known rune. It appears three times in Beowulf as an ideogram for its rune name, first on line 520, when Beowulf's childhood friend Brecker receives the land of the Brondings. Secondly, line 913, where it refers to the Ethel of the Shildings, this is the Hall Herot, where the Danes lived. Thirdly, in line 1702, where Hrothgar praises Beowulf as the Ethel Weyard, the guardian of the homeland. This rune is then unique in an Old English context, as it is used more to refer to the concept of an Ethel than it is to its obscure sound value. This is the only rune for which this is the case, and its meaning must have been quite widely known, especially unusual given how rare the sound value was. This tells us that the concept of an ethel carries considerable weight, something which we already know, because the independently owned landstead, while owing fealty to a king, is the backbone of Anglo-Saxon and wider Germanic society. Maureen Halsall points out that, as this is usually the final rune of the original 24 rune Elder Futhark, this would mean that the runic alphabet is beset on two sides by agricultural concepts. The first rune would have originally referred to cattle, and this rune refers to an owned landstead. In an ancient rune poem, which doesn't survive, this may have been a good ending point. These two runes are the 25th and 26th of the Anglo-Frisian Futhork. They have both branched off from the Futhork's fourth rune, which is named Urs. Their appearance is clearly descended from the Urs rune. Their sound values are R, as in my British English arc, and A, as in my British English cat. In appearance, the second rune is identical to the Elder Futhark's fourth rune, but because of a change in sound value, it's necessary to give the rune and sound value a new name, this apparently knocks it out from fourth place in the Futhork. This would appear to be normal when a rune changes shape and sound value, as is what happens to the younger Futhark's 16th rune. Of the first rune, the Old English rune poem says, Ark nourishes meat on the land for the children of men. Often it travels over the gannet's bath. The stormy sea tests whether the Ark keeps faith nobly. It refers to the oak tree, first as its usefulness to feed animals, which in turn are food for men, then its usefulness as ship timber. Of the second rune, the Old English rune poem says, Ash is extremely tall, precious to mankind, strong on its base, it holds its ground as it should, although many men attack it. The ash tree is very similar to the ao, to the birch, and to the ark rune numbers 13, 18, and 25. That men attack it could refer to the fact that the ash tree is difficult to cut down, or could refer to the ash wood's usefulness for weapons, specifically for spears. 
Both entries of the rune poem describe trees, and both are given a very naturalistic description. Neither opts for heavy metaphors or refers to the deep past in a way that can be remotely interpreted as ritualistic. This tells us what we already know. These runes are more recent additions to the Futhork. It makes sense that runes which were invented to store sound values opt for common words which can act as mnemonic devices, and which aim to help people to remember the sound value of different runes. This rune is the 27th of the Anglo-Frisian Futhork. It appears to be branched off from the second rune, and it has a subscript of the 11th rune below it. It appears to be a ligature of the two, and represents the sound value U, as in the modern French tu. In the Old English rune poem, we're told that Ur is a pleasure and brings honour to all princes and nobles. It looks fine on a steed, and is reliable on a journey a kind of army gear. The poem's description is slender and unhelpful. We aren't sure what this rune's name means. But based on the poem, arguments have been made for a few names. Saddle would make sense, as it is said to look fine on a steed. Horn would make tangential sense, and this would tie it to the second rune, meaning aura. If this is the meaning, the poem likely refers to battle horns which were blown as they are in Beowulf before encroaching further towards Grendel's Mere. The most tempting, though not necessarily most correct interpretation, is that the rune means bow. This would tie its meaning to the Norse rune, Ur, which is the same sound value and refers to the yew tree, the tree which would best be used to make bows. For what it's worth, I'm not overly convinced by this argument, but it could be the case that the poems influenced each other, and from Norse influence, this rune was given the same name, though different meaning, and represents the same sound value. This rune is the 28th of the Old English rune poem, but whether it is a rune at all has come into question, because it's not found outside the poem, it has no pairing in other runic alphabets, and its sound value doesn't really make sense. Its similarity in appearance to a variant of the 12th rune has led R.I. Page to dismiss it as a pseudo-rune. Its name varies, being given as Ya or Yor, with a sound value of the diphthong Io. This is again similar to the 12th rune, but it's absolutely unattested outside of the poem. The Old English rune poem says, Yor is a river fish, and yet it always takes its food on land. It has a beautiful dwelling place, surrounded by water, where it lives in delight. We don't know what this is. It's not a word that we know, but based on its context, suggestions include eel, beaver, or newt. There is also the possibility that it could mean boat. In Old Norse, boats are sometimes referred to as yaw. One of the more unconvincing and unlikely theories is that this refers to Midgarth Sorma of Norse cosmic mythology. I don't think I need to outline why that is such an immensely unlikely possibility in a Christian rune poem, two to three hundred years after conversion, when other entries have so clearly been altered away from pagan stories, but it's worth entertaining anyway when we have so little evidence. Truth be told, we have absolutely no idea what this rune means, what its functionality is, or why, despite its similarity to the twelfth rune, it was considered important enough that it was awarded not only its own sound value, but its own verse in the rune poem. This is the 29th and final rune of the Old English rune poem, and is the 28th and final rune of most Futhorks. Its sound value is a diphthong, connecting the a as in my accent's hail, and a as in my accent's hat, for the sound air. The Old English rune poem tells us that Ea is loathsome to every man, when irresistibly the flesh begins to grow cold, the livid one to choose earth as its bedfellow. Fruits fail, joys vanish, man-made covenants are broken. This is the last entry of the Old English rune poem, and it's very typical of Old English poetry to end on a frankly depressing note. We aren't certain exactly what Ea is, but based on this passage, it's taken to mean Earth, but specifically within the context of death. 
AR communicates the Christian concept of dust, the creation of man from dust at the beginning of the Bible, just like Rune 20. It's been argued that the word was simply created to store the rune's sound value. Maureen Halsall says of this rune that everything that earth can offer to man, including all the wonders and pleasures celebrated within the previous 28 runes, is shown now to be an ephemeral and untrustworthy illusion. Thus, the poet affords his audience the best possible reason for his insistent exhortation from the very first stanza of the Old English rune poem, Feo, or Wealth, to give away all of his earthly things on which humans are tempted to rely. At the bottom of the Old English rune poem, we're presented with four runes which do not have lines in the poem at all. The first pair of these runes are Gar and Kalk, potentially the 30th and 31st runes of the Anglo-Frisian Futhork. They are thought to be specific to the Northumbrian tradition, and they were likely introduced due to local accent changes in the K rune Ken and G rune Gifu, runes 6 and 7, where the former was pronounced as CH as in church, and the latter was pronounced as Y as in yet. Gar and Kalk likely represent the linguistic sound holes that were left by this change, so that G and K could still be inscribed. We are fairly certain what Gar means. Gar is a word which is used to refer to a spear that's now obsolete in modern English, but it still exists in other Germanic languages. About Kalk, we are much more uncertain. Possibilities include chalk, chalice, or sandal, but we don't really know. Gar and Kalk are rare in inscriptions, but they are used in a few places in the north of England and the south of Scotland most famously on the Ruthwell Cross. It's unsurprising that these runes physically resemble Gifu and Ken. Gar is an altered Gifu, and Kalk is a doubled Ken. This gives the impression of the rune being an upside-down Eilksedge, or rune 15 in the Anglo-Frisian Futhork. R.I. Page suspects that these runes are loaned from the Northumbrian dialect, and then given these names by a learned rune master somewhere in the south of Britain. At the bottom of the Old English rune poem, we are presented four runes which do not have lines in the poem devoted to them. The second pair of these are the runes Stan and Querth, potentially the 32nd and 33rd runes of the Anglo-Frisian Futhork. The 30th and 31st runes can be explained as a result of sound changes which are unique to Northumbria, but these two runes are unexplained and unattested anywhere outside of this sole manuscript. The first rune, Stan, is the most confusing. We do know that its name means stone, but it doesn't seem to serve a linguistic purpose, and it doesn't seem to resemble or be related to any other known rune. Any potential sound value are all represented by other runes. The most likely answer is that it represents a diphthong, the st sound at the beginning of the modern English word stone but R.I. Page has dismissed it as a pseudo-rune, believing that it was never actually used in inscriptions. If it was used, I would argue that its purpose was similar to the Ethel rune, that it was rarely used to represent its sound, but it instead represented the concept. It could have been Scrabble shorthand to write the word, but we have no evidence for this at all. The second rune is named Querth. In appearance, it's similar to Perth, the 14th rune, the Old English P rune of unknown meaning, and which is rare in inscriptions. The similarity of their names and appearances mirrors the similarity of appearance to P and Q in the Latin alphabet. It could be the case that Querth is a rune invented to represent the sound value Qu, as in the modern English Queen, or in the Latin Que. We know from St. Cuthbert's coffin that Latin inscriptions could be made with runes by and for the most elite of the church. It could simply be the case that no Latin inscriptions made with the qu sound have yet to be found, or that none have survived. But it could also be the case that this is another pseudo-rune, invented to solve the problem of how to fully write Latin 
in ruins. We'll probably never understand these two runes. They could have been invented by George Hicks, who wrote down the Old English rune poem in the 17th century, or they could have been invented by a 10th century expert rune master, or they could have been genuine used runes of which no evidence survives. In this series, we have covered 72 runes from three different runic alphabets. We look at them mainly through the lens of rune poems, the Old English, Old Norwegian and Old Icelandic, which means that we're seeing them not just as the practical letters which they were, we're seeing each rune explored as though it were a riddle. This tells us not just their names, but reveals a whole host of aspects of society which, without the poems, we could only have guessed about. The Ur rune in the Anglo-Frisian Futhork, named for the Auruk, tells us that, despite being extinct in Britain, Anglo-Saxon culture was still amazed by nature, it was still obsessed with hunting, and it remembered tales of these great beasts, likely helped by the Auruk horns, ancient treasures from the continent from which Anglo-Saxon kings and lords drank. The rune Ing does this as well. We can tell that Anglo-Saxon Britain is obsessed with its heroes, and it told stories of their deeds, both before and after their conversion to Christianity. And if you extrapolate, dangerously far, mind you, then you can draw the stories and beliefs of Ing back to Europe's earliest agrarian societies. It is absolutely fascinating to bear all of this in mind, and it's tempting to use this knowledge to reconstruct aspects of ancient pagan beliefs. But sometimes, and indeed in almost all contexts, a rune is just a rune. An ur, or ing rune, used in the context of a carving, doesn't communicate any of this cultural or ancient baggage that we see in the poem. When it comes to the runes and the rune poems, we can't look at them as representative of any kind of pagan survival. On doing this, specifically with Beowulf, Tolkien constructed a metaphor. A man found old stones in an unused patch, and from them he made a rock garden. Others saw the rock garden. They saw that it had once been a much more ancient building. They tore the garden apart, attempting to recreate this ancient building and then they inspected the garden. This garden is interesting, but what a jumble and confusion it is. This man had no sense of proportion. If the runes are the stones, and the rock garden is our rune poems, then by picking them apart, and removing them from their contexts, we lose sight of the runes and rune poems for what they are, and for what they, stand alone, can tell us. I do hope you've enjoyed this series. Please like, comment and subscribe and share it with your friends. This sounds like an over-exaggeration, but this video represents almost a year's work. I hope you have a good day.